Welcome to Cancer Talks, a podcast sharing stories of personal transformation and collective healing from people who have been touched by cancer. My name is Claire DeLazlo, and I'll be guiding today's conversation. Our guest, Mark Hancock, co-founded Humanizing Medicine in Atlanta with the belief that everyone should have access to quality integrative healthcare. In addition to being board certified in family medicine, Mark has immersed himself in many different practices, including painting, farming, and philosophy of medicine. Of painting, he says, the absolute focus on receiving sense impressions in an awake, open, and scientific state of mind that occurs when painting a still life, portrait, or landscape is also essential in medicine. He lives with his wife and business partner, Enid, and their six daughters on an urban homestead with chickens, goats, a food forest, and biodynamic permaculture gardens. Hi, Mark. Welcome to Cancer Talks. Hello, Claire. Thank you for having me. So you have an integrative practice and your clinic is called Humanizing Medicine. So I thought we could start with what you mean by humanizing medicine. What does that mean to you? It's a good question. To me, it means that a big struggle, and it's reflected in many things, from patients feeling not heard and feeling over-sterilized by our conventional medical system to healthcare providers feeling burned out, feeling like a cog in the wheel instead of the human beings that we are meant to you know, humbly serve other people, that somehow we need to transform that system back into something that is more human, that that can relate to others. And when I named it Humanizing Medicine, I, I actually was thinking of the whole of what I've been trained in, which is anthroposophic medicine. And I thought to myself, well, how can I, in two words, try to encompass what I think that this healing modality, what the purpose of it is, And I spent forever (laughs) trying to to figure that out. And then I realized, well, it's all about humanizing medicine. When I go to an anthroposophic hospital in Europe, it's like, wow, this this whole, from the architecture to the people you meet, it's it's human. And for listeners who maybe aren't familiar, could you give a brief um, description of anthroposophic medicine? Yeah, sure. It's a it, it's it's relatively young compared to most of our Eastern modalities like TCM. Anthroposophic medicine just had its hundredth birthday. It comes from the worldview of anthroposophy from Rudolf Steiner and Ida Wegman, and they work together to form a medical system that answered the question of how do you go beyond just the physical human being. And they, they looked at, and not just postulated, Steiner really gave a pathway for people to being able to perceive the other levels of the human being, aside from the mineral physical. There's the etheric, which he called the uh, etheric, which is the life body, and the astral, which encompasses the, the soul level of the human being, and the eye organization which is our individual biography. So all of these four levels penetrate in and play in to our whole lives. And it also we're able to create ways of working with the human being that buoy up and help lift up some of the ones that are weaker. So there's different modalities that we're working with and interweaving them together. So there's eurythmy therapy, so it's a type of movement therapy. There's um, uh, an anthroposophic way of working with art therapy. Um, There's mistletoe, which is really one type of herbal remedy that was talked about a hundred years ago and is becoming popular more and more today, um, where the extracts of mistletoe are injected either subcutaneous or intravenous. And there's a lot of the, there's an entire nursing training. It's quite well developed over in Europe. There's medical schools that are anthroposophic medical school and residency program, public hospitals, nursing program. There's quite a lot there um, for 
<laughs> being only a hundred years old. So, but that's yeah. a great taste. And I love just to come back to your the name of your clinic, humanizing medicine. That it implies that you know the human is all of these aspects. You know, we're not complete without these four aspects together and and it also sort of draws attention to the fact that a lot of western medicine especially in the states only deals with the physical and biological yeah so i love that i want to dive a little more specifically into your history with cancer working with cancer and i'm wondering if you could trace um, an earliest memory of cancer like I mean, maybe it's not literally your earliest memory, but if you go way back, you have some young or childhood moment where cancer came into your life. Mm. It's a good question, really. I would say I'm very fortunate to not have family members that the direct family members that have gone through cancer. It's very rare. But I do remember in grade school, one of my dear teachers she didn't keep it very public, but she kept it more to herself. But I remember overhearing a conversation. I was in fifth grade and she was talking about having a mastectomy and going through cancer treatments. And I, to me, the whole world was a little bit shattered at that point. Mm. Well, my teacher has, what is this? Um, yeah. And I, yeah, that, that was a, a big deal back then. And was it just, what is this? Or did you also have some way at the time that you made sense of or defined what cancer might be? Um, it, to me, it seemed like something, because I had known her before, and it almost was a realization, too, that that I could sense that she was confronting something really mm -hmm. difficult. And that uh, in some sense, she was a very different person. Um, yeah. Before versus after. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you could see where it changed her. Um, and I remember in fifth grade realizing, oh, it was almost like a recognition when I had overheard it. And, you know, she was having more of a discussion with her colleagues. And I was down the hall 10 feet. Um, and I didn't tell anyone else. I was just like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And there might be some important things in between on this cancer journey, but today, how would you describe cancer, what it is? In a way, uh, I think that I've learned a lot since then. Um, I'm, I'm so glad. When many people ask me, well, how did you get interested in X, Y, or Z? I think that most integrative doctors, really all the good ones that I know, and there are many, they, they did it through following their patients, um, mm -hmm. through being approached by a, a patient saying, look, I either am, I'm out of options or my options are, are not great here. Here's what the docs are saying. And here's, here's this thing. I want to try it, whether it's IV vitamin C and, or maybe it's mistletoe or maybe it's ozone or some other modality. And it gives us a a decision to, ch to do. We can either say, well, I'm going to stay in my world and just say, no, that puts me at risk. Or I'm going to say, well, I care about you and I want to give you an option. Um, for me, meeting people who get diagnosed with cancer, whether it is a, a stage one early, very curable cancer, or whether it's a, a just sudden diagnosis of something that the specialists say, well, you've got three months to live. Either way, it, it is, you are bringing mortality right in front of the person. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really a big deal. I mean, I think there's two sides to that. One side is a blessing. And, and I often talk about my, my experience in the anatomy lab. We used real cadavers, people who volunteered the end of their lives. I want to be put to use by medicine. But the first time I saw that cadaver, I was struck by, this is me sometime. And mm. I want to make my life mean something. And that's never gone away. I mean, I, I feel like that 
Yes, I learned a lot about anatomy, but that was probably the biggest thing that I realized in med school mm -hmm. was that motivation. And my patients are motivated. And, and I feel so lucky that A, they're out of the box thinkers, they're so motivated. And you might have a sense that being around cancer is doom and gloom, but if you come through my clinic, it is full of laughter and positivity. It is just beautiful. Like, so it's this resilience in the face of that. And so there's this double side of, of meeting something difficult of yes, whoa, it's a wake up call. So part of cancer is it has this mission to say, whoa, how have I been living? And what do I want my life to mean? And how do I need to change things? And the second part is that it is a foreign aspect of what the person really is. Mm -hmm. It's this mutated and, and deformed aspect of who they are. Wow. And, and the mission is they need to overcome that. They need to recognize and overcome. Also on a molecular level, we know that that's true. If a person's body, could, it, their immune system could see that cancer then in, in a matter of weeks, it would be cured. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the difficulty is uncloaking it. I love the way that you lift up patients as sort of part of your research process and that not only are integrative doctors, you know, living with this motivation to learn new ways of healing and, and leave those for generations to come, but that the anyone with cancer is part of this process of learning and and finding developing new modalities. It's beautiful. I feel really lucky that I get to to meet all of these people that and I'm just humbled that I'm get to be part of their lives. So you touched on what it looks like, what's required and then what it looks like to heal the cancer. I'm wondering how you understand healing in the context of cancer. What well, you know, um, <laughs> enough said, but it's something that I've been trying to wrap my head around. And I know there's a lot of gray area. So curious how you relate to that. That's a beautiful question, really and truly. I mean, if healing were just, oh, you, you had cancer and then you did all of these things and what, whatever those are, and you don't have cancer, and you're not really changed. I don't think that, that would be so superficial. No one would say, yeah, I'm healed. Um, mm -hmm. that, that wouldn't make any sense. Um, it, clearly, there's something really transformative that happens in healing. I think we could say that as maybe a common agreement that we, we change ourselves. We, we become more of ourselves when we heal. And every illness is actually something that potentially is put there by ourselves so that we can meet ourselves in a new way, which is hard to think about, hard to fathom. You're like, wait, what? But in meeting those obstacles, we come, become more of ourselves. We wake up to ourselves. The healing that, that can happen um, through cancer is probably some of the most profound and dramatic that, that I've ever seen. The next question that I wanted to ask is about how you deal with death, which is, I don't want to put it in direct opposition to healing because I think healing can happen in the dying process too, in its own way. But yeah, I'm curious when you speak of the transformation that can happen through cancer, does that transformation always look like living or what other kinds of transformations have you witnessed in your work? No, thank you for bringing that up, Claire. A lot of people are scared to talk about death. And so I, I respect that a lot that you could even ask that, that's, that's big. Yeah, there's, if you work in oncology, you realize really quickly that, that it's amazing when you can step in and, and, you know, there are people I can say, wow, if, if it hadn't been for things that I was able to make them aware of or help them do, these people wouldn't be on the earth anymore. And that's like, wow. But on the other hand, there's also people that, again, we can, we can use all the mistletoe, we can use all the vitamin C, do everything perfectly right. And why hasn't there, there may have been even an internal transformation so that there was clearly healing. And I've seen this, but the, the physical wasn't able to do it. 
and the, the person passes away. And that does happen. But to me, the fact that there can be a transformation inwardly of real heat, that there has been a healing, that's so important. I think that as a doctor, I look at death a lot of ways. And, and I think through medicine, we've always looked at death, even, even conventionally. We, we have these things called, you know, the M&M &M report or these conferences. I don't know if you've heard of that. The, the no, I don't. What is M&M? &M? Yeah. M&M &M is not the candy. It's morbidity and mortality. So wow. if, you, if you're in a group in a hospital or a large group and you're involved in a case that didn't go well, mm. you will want to bring that up in front of everyone, all of your peers. Um, and it's a it's wow. complete 100% confidential. Nothing leaves a room, nothing from that. It's protected, I think, legally too. So nothing can go into like other areas. It's just, we need to process it. We also need to learn from it. So conventionally, it's the m, &M is more, uh, um, today anyway, looked at as more of an educational um, mm -hmm. thing in a very deep sense. So, you know, if, if one of my colleagues uh, in residency had a, a patient that they didn't find a blood clot soon enough and that patient died and they they brought that forward in m, &M and we, you know, you're sort of like, whoa, because you're like, wow, that could have been me. I could have missed that too because the patient was just a little, you know, they were young, they had a cough, they were a little short of breath, wouldn't have thought about that. And whoa, look what happened. So then it triggers you to think of other things. So that's one aspect, purely educational. But of course, the older m &Ms, I think, were also this something in the soul is happening. With, mm -hmm. like you have this connection. Um, in our clinic, we, and, it, and it's really a feather out of the anthroposophic model over in Europe, they actually have a great respect for um, patients that we've all been connected with in their healing journey. If and when they transition, um, there's a wake, there's a three day wake and the, mm -hmm. the hospitals actually have built, um, they're not morgues uh, and they have a morgue, but they have, they have a death room where it's a beautiful room. I have pictures of it. And I, the first time I toured the hospital, I nearly cried going here. Um, because it's a, it's a special platform that's cooled. The patient is put there for three days. Mm. Um, the family can go there. But what happens is that every person that has taken care of them goes and visits and, and is in, the, in their presence. Um, wow. Because as someone dies in their body in the first few days, what, what they put in, in their life as memories, they start to they start to, to go out into the cosmos. And, it, and just being in the presence of that is very healing and you can connect uh, again. And of course you never leave that person, but so much, there's so much we do that we can honor the, those that have passed. It's a, it's a very good question. In our group we, here, we don't have a death room. We don't have that capacity yet, but what, what we do is we have a group that meets and when one of our patients passes, we light a candle, we talk about them and we remember them. Um, and it, it's a small thing. And we often do, there's a, Eurythmy is a, a movement uh, modality that can be used in healing, but we also practice it. Um, there's something called the hallelujah that we, we do when we remember the dead person, uh, person that's transitioned because they're not gone, they're, the, their soul aspect is still there. They're actually more awake, more alive and more conscious than when they're here on earth. It's so interesting to hear you talk about the breadth of your practice from like having this experience and awareness of a more conventional medical system and what those procedures look like. And I mean, I've just never heard any doctor talk about death, I don't think. <laughs> um, in such a way, you know, and as you were describing the M&M &M, um, in the conventional sense, the word failure came to mind. And I, I wonder if that 
you also were putting it in positive light that it's treated as an educational experience. But I wonder if at a certain point in your training, you were made to feel that a death would be a failure and how that's clearly not how you relate to it now. So I'm wondering like how that reframing happened for you. Mm. It's it's probably still something that I'm actively reframing because that's very strong in medicine is that you, you either completely disconnect and you're like, okay, next. And, and we do that. Uh, as I used to work in a hospital for, for 10 years, um, I worked full-time in a hospital as a hospitalist. So just managing people that were inpatients in a hospital. Many times I would be called by the nurse, okay, this patient is, has died. Uh, we expected it. We, we just need a doctor to pronounce them dead. So you'd go in, you'd pronounce them dead and, and then you'd have to go from there to the next room and, and talk about uh, how someone's kidneys are getting better and they can go home. And, and it's like, how do you shift gears so fast? It's like, whoa. But the really difficult would be when things are unexpected, when someone goes into cardiac arrest in the hospital and you have a code. And many times we're not successful. Sometimes we are, and it's like, you feel like, wow, we're, we got them in the ICU, their heart's going, they're, they're alive again. This is, this is amazing. Sometimes we, we have to call it. We, we're like, we worked and we worked on this person and, and we, we can't do anything more. Um, conventionally, when I've been in that setting, everyone just walks away. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's so much activity, so much going on. We're doing everything. And then we call the code and everyone just sort of shrugs their shoulders and, you know, 20 people disappear from the room without even a, a, a second. And so when I started leading codes in the small hospital where I was a program director, whenever we called a code, I said, let's take a moment of silence for this individual. Um, and it really transformed the experience. I think people mm -hmm. wanted that and we just didn't have a, a format for it. And so, yeah, we just took a few seconds and said, and, and really allowed our soul to connect with that person. Um, I, I think that was really, a, I mean, very, very small change in practice because you don't really have a lot of time in the hospital, but just 10 seconds is enough. Yeah, makes me wonder when a practice like that fell out of, of you know, conventional medical practice because we know that there were times and there still are many places and many doctors who would hold space in that way. But yeah, such an important practice that got left off somewhere. Yeah. But speaking to what you asked, I mean, in terms of how do I not feel like I've failed mm -hmm. when a patient passes, it's that's that's still a struggle. It, yeah. I think trying to be the doctor. Uh, and be the healer and the one that hopefully brings a solution into, you know, sometimes it, it just isn't possible. And sometimes the person is just incredible. And maybe this goes back to what is cancer? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. 100%, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, it's a good answer. <laughs> but it's certainly, I mean, I, I meet patients and I'm like, wow, they're such incredible people. And I thought, you know, if we took out the, the difficult, all the difficult situations in someone's life, we wouldn't necessarily know how amazing they were. Mm. Not that I want them to go through cancer, but it, like, you know, to be someone in your 20s and, and be diagnosed with something that we're like, well, you, you're going to need to have a lot of courage here. Or you don't have to. You could just do whatever the doctors say and and be completely passive. But the patients I see are the ones that just they they have courage. They're thinking outside the box. They're saying, "I don't accept that this is necessarily terminal." And wow, um, I wish I could take this just completely away from you. But but it, they shine. They really shine. But you do get the sense that. Of course, we feel like we want to help as as a healer. Yeah. And I think in every single person, we have to process that. That you know, it, it doesn't just go away. That, oh, I, this person 
transitioned and they were special to me. And why couldn't I have done better? In a way that's important yeah. to think because I do want to do better. I do, you know, it, it, it's maybe a conventional oncologist and conventional docs thought that we would, they would become integrative all of a sudden. And I don't know. <laughs> but. Do you have any practices you return to to grieve or mourn for yourself outside this moment of lighting the candle? Yeah, I do. I, as a doctor, I still have a practice that's meditative. And I, I really don't believe that when someone has crossed the, the threshold of death that they're gone. Actually, one way to look at this is that everything that is conscious in us is created at the expense of a death process, actually. Um, and mm. there's a lot of ways to sort of look at that. I mean, it's, but consciousness comes out of a death process. Our brain doesn't create consciousness, but it, it, it's, it's a, a vehicle of it. And it's a vehicle that takes a lot of energy because it's always right on the verge of death. So how do we know if a cell is dead? We know that a cell's dead if it if its polarity with the with the outside solution is equal. So if it doesn't have a charge, basically. Mm -hmm. And so what are nerve cells doing all the time when they're when they're conscious, when they're when we're thinking? They depolarize briefly in it for a millisecond. We're depolarizing our nerves. So when we're dead, all of that completely is depolarized. So our consciousness is complete at that point. That's one way to even look. But anyway, I think that staying in communion, um, and to me that means being able to meditate and speak to people who have passed and transitioned, that, that's given me a lot of, yeah, it, it, it's given me a lot of resolve. And it's a way that I can carry them inside of me and still continue to, to function and without burning out and without having to separate. That I, that I know that the connection we made was something special mm -hmm. and, and is still there and alive. Speaking of special connections, I'm wondering if you could share the story of a patient who really affirmed your purpose as a doctor and what you do. Thank you. I have a patient and she's, she called me several years ago. She lived about a, a state and a half away and yeah, probably a oh, good three or four hour drive. And this was when we didn't have this big clinic. It, it was, I was still working full time or doing a, I don't know how she even found me. I mean, we didn't really advertise. It was all, there was maybe one place that, they, that she could have found me. Um, at that point, I was probably the only doctor in the Southeast that might still be, um, there is a, there's somebody in Florida now that's doing fever therapy that I'm mentoring, but we would, we would give an overdose of mistletoe uh, intentionally in order to create a fever. Um, this lady was, uh, she was very introverted, very, she knew herself. She had been diagnosed with breast cancer. She had two children and, and had done surgery, and then she'd done a Gerson therapy, went to a Gerson center, actually. And she told me there, she said, you know, I kept in touch with these people, and the person on my left and the person on my right uh, that we sat together, they actually did really well. For whatever reason, it wasn't for me. And I, I had her this recurrence, and her recurrence was only local, it was only in the breast, and it was rock hard and, and fungating and, and very large, about the size of, almost the size of a fist, uh, saucer size. And it really was hard. It was like a, a rock there. And she felt very self-conscious about it because when she would hug her children, she felt that it would come in between, that there was this hard thing there. And she was doing a medicine called Herceptin. She was her positive and it didn't really work well. Uh, it didn't change it. And that was the point she reached out to me and she said, you know, I'm interested in what you would do with mistletoe. And the mentor I had had, Dr. Orange, he was very much in favor of provoking a fever with mistletoe on purpose. It's not how most people use it. 
maybe one percent of the time uh, it's used that way, or maybe five. It's a rarity because you're basically giving a very large amount of mistletoe under the skin, which triggers a big immune response and a big fever response. So for three days, you typically get a fever up to 103 to 105. At the same time, we can put the mistletoe, which has its own anti-cancer effects, we can put it locally in the tumor. And we talked about it. I said, look, I don't know what will happen because this is a large area. What if it, if it all, if it works? Best case scenario, how will you heal? I don't know because that might all just be dead tissue and you might need a skin graft. I, I just don't know. I wanted to tell her here's what the possible complications are. Of course, it might not work at all. She knew that and we didn't, yeah. So we, we talked about it. It's a physiologic fever, which means that it's not a dangerous thing. Even though it goes relatively high, it's something your body's doing. It's triggered to do, but your body's in charge of it. So it's not going to go to a, a, a fever that causes brain damage or something. That's completely different. It's called malignant hyperthermia. So she, she had to have inner courage. Everyone who does a fever therapy, they really have to make a decision, a courageous decision. And she said, yes, I want to do this. I'm otherwise strong. I think I can do it. So she came. At that time, it was a donation-based clinic. We were just doing infusions and making it available to people. So she came to my house. We didn't have a clinic except for a little consult room in, a, in sort of the hippie part of Atlanta back then. Um, it was really fun. And she came and, and for the first fever, um, this was the most amazing thing. We, we gave her the infusion, we gave her the thing, and we put a little bit of mistletoe into the tumor, a little bit at a time. Um, and, and then I sent her home because you don't have the fever right away. So then she had a fever about 24 hours, 18 hours later. And when she came back, she said, I, I had such a profound experience, Dr. Hancock. I want to share it with you. So I've never, ever been able to sleep well. Never. Number one. Number two, I've never had a lucid dream in my life. Never. And, and I always struggle with anxiety and past traumas. So she said she got this fever. It was uncomfortable at first. And then later that evening, she fell asleep and she had a lucid dream. She didn't even know what that meant before. She was completely awake and aware in the dream. She remembers being there, looking at herself, looking down at her chest where this big rock of a cancer, and it really was like a rock. Even putting a needle in, it almost wouldn't go in. Um, it was that, so much calcified tissue was there. And she looked at it and she said, and she had pity on herself on, on this area, she said she patted it in her dream and, and she wasn't anxious at all. And she just said, it's time to go now. And then she had a, the most feeling of sublime peace that she's ever had. And she slept and woke up and she really felt so changed and so peaceful inside. And she, yeah, like her whole, her whole being was strengthened and, and different. And that, that continued. So the story with her was, is really beautiful because this actually happened. Um, with the mistletoe, this rock, by the time she left in a few weeks, it, was, it wasn't any smaller. And I said, gosh, did we do anything good for you? But what happened, which was really clear, is this, this tumor was soft. It went from literally like a rock to by the time she left, it was like a sponge. I mean, it was that soft. I never seen anything as extreme. I have seen things soften, but not like this. And then, and this is why I, I really feel in her mission, it was almost a way, because she's still alive. And she, she sent me, this was months later, because she continued doing her septum afterwards. And it was almost like the her septum that really didn't do anything to the tumor. It didn't shrink it, it didn't, but the tumor wasn't growing. When she went back and continued the Herceptin, she has photo documentation. She sent it all to me months later, and she said, I, I need to recount the story of what happened. And 
the fear that I had that everything would just die if it succeeded, that wasn't the case either. This tumor started going away and, and she was under the care of a wound care doctor who kept really good photo evidence of what was happening. And the, the tumor shrank and shrank and shrank away till it was just skin there, it was just skin. There was one satellite lesion that for, I don't know, like, dang, why didn't that one also go away too? So there was one that didn't go away, a small piece this big, but the part that was this big completely disappeared from her body over the course of a few months. And I don't think it was just the Herceptin. That's much as clear because the Herceptin had already been tried for months before. And I don't think it was only the mistletoe because, well, yeah, but I think working together, it was really clear. But to me, the, the, the change that happened inside of her was the most important. I mean, it, it was something that I've seen in many cases where some, where the healing happens inside and it also happens outside. And that was a, a yeah, she's, she's given me so much strength just of saying, look, I, I, I really love what you helped me do. And she, yeah, she's a beautiful person. Um, why, why someone gets cancer like this, it's hard to say. You know, it, it's hard to say she's had a otherwise normal person, you know, in her around little younger than a little older than me with two kids. And now dealing with this, this problem, this, this cancer, but these long standing things that were present in her life as emotional burdens, she, she really knowing her for the next several years till now, those aren't there anymore. They're, they're, they're transformed. And I don't know what else would have done that. That gave me, it made a huge impression on me of someone who has, has uh, transformed inwardly and outwardly. Mm -hmm. I think you've answered my last question in a lot of different ways, but if cancer could talk, what do you think cancer has to teach us? Well, I think that I'm always very careful with, with disease processes in general, especially cancer. Um, I don't think it's as clear cut as, uh, and yes, I, I do, through my worldview, believe in reincarnation and karma, and that our old ways of living and habits and even transgressions against others, those come, we have to deal with those in some way. And sometimes it arises in illness. That's one possibility. But there's two others that also play in. And one is we are also here to, and, and I've met amazing people like this, almost like a saint. They're here to go through process for other people, not because they did anything, but because it will help others really as a self-sacrifice. And that can be one meaning of the illness is that they, it's not like they needed it. They didn't need it, but they, did it as a self-sacrifice. The third thing is a little more scary and I think more, yeah, more widespread. And the, that is that we are living in what, what I'd call world karma, maybe as a summary of that. We, we live in a, in a world that, you know, our grandfathers, grandmothers had a much, they, they had 100% organic food to eat. They didn't even know what pesticides and all that were. And before that, the, you know, their grandparents, there wasn't really and truly pollution in the world 100, 150 years ago, not to the degree that we have it now. Um, yes, there was, of course, industrial age, but now we've taken that to such an extreme that we bear it as a consequence as a whole people, just, just from the fact that, okay, I want to live on the earth right now in this time period. Well, guess what? We are lonelier. We are eating polluted food. We are. We have to be resilient because we can't avoid all that things. Yes, we can make attempts, but we have to deal with it and try to be resilient. So, in some way, cancer is this wake-up call, not personally necessarily, but also, wow, look at all of what we have made the world. That's a little bit scary, actually. 
so in a way it's threefold. One is very beautiful. The other is this internal wakefulness and the other is an external wakefulness. That's sort of the, the three paths I think we can look at as what is cancer telling us? And, and I think that on the whole, many people would describe cancer as being very, uh, they are very cold, not as cold people, but their body temperature stays cold. They haven't had inflammatory responses or triggers to um, infections. We are really, you know, very happy to, to damp down infections and tamp out infectious disease. And we don't get that pump primed of the immune system. We don't get the, those things to wake up. And, and that's okay. That's part of us actually advancing as a culture. But as we advance, we, we need to do something that makes up for that. And I think that, that those some things are pedagogical in our educational system. So what, what can be put there that gives us warmth? Um, when we're educated. And I think that's what we see in the Waldorf School. And that's one thing that Steiner was trying to, to do when he created biodynamic agriculture. You don't see pesticides and, and the like used in, in biodynamic agriculture either. So cancer in a way is trying to tell us that we are too isolated and that that comes out in a very interesting Swedish study that showed that the more people you live, uh, the more people in your house, I try to remember this because I have a crowded house with all these kids and uh, <laughs> everything, <laughs> but the more people in your house, the more protection from cancer. So if you're a household of one, you're at much higher risk of cancer than if you're a household of eight. And of course, now we're more and more isolated from our grandparents, our uncles, our extended family, it's in the way of at least Western culture. We're, we're more isolated. And I think that's one thing cancer saying. The other is just saying that we need to meet the world in a different way. And we need to respect the world and the environment because that we live in this world. And whatever we do there will come back to us, whether it's we put pollution in the world, or it will come back. Yeah, so... The other piece I think is in, in that can be pedagogical is how we relate to the world through art, actually, which is which is weird. To, to me, this little instrument here at my base is is a therapy for me. I, I didn't wasn't raised on an instrument. I didn't know how to do any music. But a year and a half ago, I said I need to learn something about that, and I've learned a lot about myself taking lessons, taking bass lessons. So. I think part of that is learning how to deal with imperfections in yourself. You know, I, I like to be in a situation where things are new and you're like, I'm not perfect at playing this or I'm not perfect, et cetera. So then I can say, well, I can work at that, but also opening new worlds of, of not just being one dimensional. We need to ex expand our horizons in many directions. I think that finding that balance is one thing that cancer speaking. If you enjoyed this conversation, please leave a review in your podcast app. Cancer Talks is a platform for anyone who has been touched by cancer. Write to us at info at cancertalks.com if you have a story to share. If you'd like to be in community with other cancer thrivers seeking personal transformation, join us for free workshops on Zoom. Visit cancertalks.com slash Zoom to register.